All right, so I'm the last talk today, so hopefully I can hold your attention for just a little bit longer. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, one of the major grand challenges. I, I came from uh, Beijing about two months ago, where uh, the three academies of engineering, for the Chinese Academy of Engineering, the, uh, the Brit British uh, Academy, Royal Academy of Engineering, and the National Academy of Engineering in the U.S., uh, every two years they get together to talk about the grand challenges. They have a big forum. Okay, this past year it was in Beijing, and you know the likes of uh, Jack Ma, uh, supported by uh, Li Keqiang, our premier, and uh, you know uh, Sinopec uh, uh, chairman, and, and, and a lot of these sort of high-level people get together, and their goal is to try to figure out uh, what the grand challenges are, and uh, kind of solutions for them. So uh, today we heard a lot about different types of challenges in terms of wa water security and uh, you know there's starvation. There are a lot of these major, major problems in the world. Today I'm going to talk about the granddaddy of them all. This was agreed upon almost universally by everybody at this Grand Challenge Forum that climate change is probably the most uh, important uh, thing to fix in the next uh, coming uh, decade or so. And the reason why is while you know, uh, you know, old age and starvation and things affect millions of people. Climate change is the only one where uh, you know you can actually redraw the lines of geographies and destabilize governments uh, with just a few degrees. Okay, and so that basically, if you look here in terms of what humanity has done just in the last hundred years or so, the amount of carbon emissions, okay, which is the big contributor to climate change, has just skyrocketed through the roof. This is look, looks like an impulse. Right? And if you look at uh, where that uh, greenhouse gas is coming from, it's mostly comprised of carbon emissions, right? Carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and the like. And here's a graph of what the, uh, the, the di distribution of where the, this uh, greenhouse gas is coming from. A lot is coming from the generation of electricity in, in things like coal plants, but a lot, one third, is fully through transportation. And two thirds of that is from cars and trucks alone. Okay? So, now we're getting into this, uh, this cusp, right, where we can have this sort of uh, electric vehicle revolution. And we can essentially take two-thirds away of the uh, total, uh, you know, emissions from that category of, of, of stuff. Okay, so, but there are a couple challenges that need to be solved. Uh, EV vehicles have not really taken off, and there's a number of fundamental issues, okay? Namely, that to really take off, uh, because we are used to the, our, our sort of internal combustion uh, cars, we EV vehicles need to be competitive to them on a number of dimensions. One is the uh, range, all right? We need to have about roughly 500 kilometers of range, typical to what a gas-powered car will have. Two, performance, okay, in terms of charge time, okay? We're used to filling up the gas within five to 10 minutes. Uh, these days, EV vehicles take uh, many, many hours, sometimes overnight. And so therefore, it uh, changes our behavior, okay? And then beyond that, we need to uh, improve the service life and eliminate the fact that some of, some of these battery technologies are a little bit dangerous, all right? So what we are proposing to do for next is to develop a process, okay? We'll talk about uh, this a little bit down the road, about creating a very innovative material called graphene, which will drive and completely and uh, uh, revolutionize the EV, uh, you know, uh, market. And at the same time, it will, it also is a carbon negative process. So actually we can take waste gas emissions and convert that into a very high performance material that is useful in, not only in EV uh, uh, industry for batteries, but also can enable a lot of host of other industries. All right, so what is this material? So in 2010, everybody, these days graphene is, very, very uh, popular. Okay, so in 2010, there are a couple of Russians and basically uh, discovered this, this material. They found out that uh, basically uh, you can have existing in freestanding in nature single sheets of, uh, of carbon, hexagonal carbon uh, called graphene. All right, so they won the Nobel Prize for that. Uh, so in, in the context of research, there's been an exponential amount of papers and research being done on this miracle material. And uh, a lot of third parties have demonstrated that with a graphene uh, electrode, specifically for the anode, we can increase the capacity by 2x. We can increase the, uh, uh, the charge uh, rates by 10x. And we can increase the lifetime of these batteries by up to 4x. Right? So in a single swoop, if we are able to actually use graphene for these electrodes, we 
solve all the previous aforementioned problems of EV vehicles and we can really drive the industry. All right, so what's the problem? Well, the problem is graphene isn't cheap. All right, so this is off of the website. Uh, you know, you can go to the website now. This is the graphene supermarket. You can kind of see these prices. This is 300 US dollars per gram of the material. It's actually more costly than gold by weight. All right, and so therefore you can imagine in an EV vehicle which has over 50 kilograms of stuff, uh, you know, it's going to be quite an expensive car, high performance car to be able to use graphene. Right? So right now, this is the fundamental challenge that we're trying to solve. So there are a couple of uh, methods for producing graphene. Right? Uh, the uh, typical ways are uh, what we call mechanical exfoliation. So we take a high purity graphite and we just mill it down very laboriously and in, in small quantities. Uh, the second way is uh, we a chemical process where we use a bunch of chemistries to reduce graph, gra uh, graphene oxide, graphite oxide, to create this graphene. And the third way, uh, primarily by uh, Samsung, is we can deposit it atomistically, layer by layer, uh, using a process called chemical vapor deposition, or CVD. Right? All of these processes are not mass manufacturable. If you look at the roadmaps for all these uh, you know, uh, companies, uh, uh, in, in the industry now, they are on the order of being able to produce something like a kilogram of this stuff per batch. Right? Now, I mentioned before already that a typical battery has 50 kilograms of stuff. Right? So again, none of these te technologies are going to be able to drive this industry at all. Right? Uh, you may have heard in China, you know, they claim to be able to produce tons of this stuff, but really that's a marketing ploy. Uh, it, it's more what we call amorphous carbon than graphene, so they're, they're not really uh, graphene-related products. We are literally the only ones in this category, you know, in, in this category for both the ability to create a, a very low-cost product as well as a very uh, high-quality, uh, high-volume product. So our goal, all right, it might, it might sound like quite extreme, but I assure you it is actually quite reasonable, is we intend to reduce the cost of graphene by at least a thousand fold, right? From $100 per gram to $100 per kilogram in the initial stage, right? And second, we will be able to increase the uh, production of the graphene from kilogram scale to ton scale. And that's what's needed to drive the market, right? If you look at Tesla's uh, roadmap, uh, by 2020, they want to have half a million cars, right? Each one of these cars has uh, about 100 pounds of uh, graphite material that they need. All right, so if you do the math, it's, only, it's going to require something on the order of 20,000 tons just for one company uh, to, to be able to do this. None of the existing companies today can come anything close to that, and we can. How do we do it? Okay, let's talk about technology. Uh, we're uh, actually, uh, my company, uh, my father actually is a very famous uh, diamond synthesis expert, um, uh, and we have uh, worked on diamond-related technologies, carbon-related technologies for the last uh, three decades or so. Uh, and uh, we are basically appropriating a completely new method for producing graphene, taking tricks of the trade from the diamond industry. So this right here is a diamond press. It's called a cubic press. And it, what, what we do is in, in the middle of this, we, we have, what, we mix a little bit of what we call invar powder. It's a little bit of uh, iron and nickel alloy as a catalyst. And we throw in some uh, uh, graphite material. And if we press this at 5.5 gigapascals and about 1400 degrees, we create an environment kind of mimicking what's similar to you know, a couple kilometers down in Earth, and we can pr pr produce diamond, synthetic diamond. This has been done since the 60s. Uh, my father used to run uh, GE's uh, diamond business. They were the inventors of this technology. So this is uh, why we have this expertise. Right? So it turns out that the same catalyst system for producing diamond is can be used to create graphene. Because uh, if you, this, this is a, 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 a atomistic scan of the uh, invar powder things. And if you look at it, is, it just so happens that the, these, these uh, atoms are, are roughly on the same scale as the graphene, uh, carbon atoms in graphene. Okay? So therefore, there's a templating that occurs. And so this system is one of the few systems that can actually dissolve uh, carbon or dissolve graphite and then re-precipitate that in the form of graphene. So our process is very simple and our, our process is very scalable. Okay, so what we do is we have a crucible. Any sort of vacuum furnace will do. You can think of it as a pot okay, that heats up 
uh, and then what we do is we put uh, uh, our, our uh, alloy in this, which is just a simple combination of uh, nickel and iron. We melt it into a solvent, okay, so it's just liquid, and then we dump any sort of carbon source into it. The carbon will melt or will, will dissolve into the solvent and then will re-precipitate itself as graphene. And that graphene will naturally flow to the top. All right? So we basically have a process that is actually uh, quite scalable because you can imagine it, this is analogous to dissolving salt in a, in, in a pot of water. Right? If you do it on a small scale and you do it on a large scale, there isn't much difference. Unlike other uh, uh, graphene manufacturing technologies. Other graphene manufacturing technologies, the machine, the area that you can do the reactions in uh, is relatively limited. We can basically scale uh, uh, infinitely. Right? In fact, we can rely on existing uh, technologies which are used industrially, uh, specifically steel making equipment. Okay? In the steel making process, we use the same exact chemistries. We're using iron, you know, what we call pig iron, and what we're trying to do in, in, in making steels, we're trying to cook out the carbon to uh, create a high quality steel. Uh, we're essentially doing the reverse process. Instead of cooking out the uh, carbon, we're super saturating the metal solvent with carbon, and that carbon reprecipitates as graphene. But we can leverage the same huge industrial furnaces, the same stuff that actually produces tons of steel, we can use that equipment uh, to create graphene. And this has been verified. We've actually taken uh, samples, uh, refuge uh, from the uh, you know steel making process, we've identified that in fact there is graphene content, although it's very dirty. So if we uh, sort of modified this equipment, then we can actually do this on a grand scale. And in fact, we're actually kind of agnostic to the uh, carbon source. So uh, we, we're, we've we've been doing stuff with graphite, but we can also imagine pumping in waste carbon gas emissions and doing and resulting in graphene production too. So again, this is where we have this carbon negative process. We're basically being able to take carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas, and converting it to what is now the most prized uh, you know, uh, you know, industrial material that will drive a lot of industries. So this is very, very exciting. Oh, and I'll also point out that uh, uh, you know, we, we, we are very uh, cognizant of IP, so we actually have quite a number of patents on the basic catalytic process. So if you're using this uh, catalyst, let, catalytic system, this is our patent. We also have uh, worked with various different techniques to mass manufacture. And finally, we've worked on application level type stuff. Okay, so we have uh, a good IP position uh, from which to work on. So what does it look like? Okay, so this picture right here is what graphene off the graphene supermarket you, you will get. Okay, you notice that it's all modeled. It looks like brand cereal, okay? And it's because the, the process is not amenable to creating what we call very high quality single crystal graphene. All right? Our process is very different. This is an optical scan of our graphene. This is a single sheet of graphene. Why is there wrinkles in this? You can think of it uh, because in our, our samples that we made, uh, the graphene sits on uh, our metal layer. We actually cool down the metal layer. Uh, and then there's, a, there's a, what we call a CT mismatch, a thermal mismatch. So the, Metal shrinks a lot, so the graphene on top kind of folds like a fabric, okay? But this is essentially one sheet of graphene. And I'll show you right here in my pocket that we can have been able to create this stuff. So this right here is also a single sheet of graphene across a few centimeters of range, okay? Most graphene has crystal domains, okay? That, that's the areas of pure, you know, uh, crystalline uh, content on the domain of nanometers to at most microns. Okay, we can do it across centimeters, and this can. There's no limitation. To this is because we use a small crucible. We can make it the size of the table if we wanted to, right? And we demonstrated this in 2006, right? This is four years before the Nobel Prize was awarded, right? So I think we have a, a very good basis of uh, being able to do this kind of stuff. You can kind of see, this is what comes out of the crucible. What this is, this, these are centimeters here. It is just thousands of layers of single crystalline graphene across the surface. And if we use some acids to kind of uh, delaminate this, you, you see the flake right there. All right? And we've done plenty of research to demonstrate that this graphene is good stuff. All right? So here we have uh, compared uh, natural graphite, a very high purity natural graphite, the best that you can get uh, in, in the market, 
And we can, if we do X-ray diffraction or we did Raman spectra and all this kind of stuff, the size of the peak basically indicates the quality or crystallinity of graphene. You can kind of see that our graphene is through the roof. The order of that across centimeters of, of, of area is, is quite extreme. Okay, we've already done some testing. We've gone to ASTAR, which is a government a research laboratory in Singapore, to uh, compare commercial graphite material versus our graphene material. You can kind of see that we get this sort of 2x sort of capacitance uh, difference, right? And if you look at the scans, this looks like a book, right? It just looks like layers and layers of really pure crystalline graphene, which is completely different than this picture itself right here, right? So we basically have the ability to engineer a perfect graphene material, the only of its type in the market. All right, so more pictures. Because of the fact that we can do this in large scale, right, we have the unique ability to actually create uh, a roll-to-roll -roll process where this graphene across a large area can be met. Right? This is, uh, no other technique can do this. Uh, of course, we need some work to engineer this, but uh, the, the theory is that we, if we produce this at just the right rate and we can do a roll-to-roll -roll process, then we can end up with a single crystal graphene across large areas. And this is extremely, extremely exciting. It will drive not only the EV market, but things like the ITO glass replacement market, right? And uh, you know, a lot of different uh, uh, markets can use this material, right? So I'll end up with the fact that uh, our material can be used in a lot of different things, um, not just the, uh, the battery market. We're, we're starting with the battery market here because I think that's gonna drive this grand challenge prob problem. But in across a wide dimension of stuff, we can mix it into composite materials. We've demonstrated, or a lot, a lot of other people have demonstrated, just a few percent of graphene by volume into a plastic can convert uh, the strength of that material by up to 8x. All right, so the idea is you can take a normal tire, mix in uh, some graphene, and end up with aircraft grade tire. Um, we, we're looking at stuff like uh, transparent conductive oxides. So basically every t uh, display that you have is uh, using rare earth metals, we call it ITO, the indium ti uh, titanium oxide, uh, to create uh, you know, conductive glass. So every display, every solar panel that you have uses this stuff, we can do it with graphene. And then finally, we have the ability to electric vehicle uh, batteries. Right? We even have the ability, okay, now because we can do large area, to do what is essentially, theoretically, the densest supercapacitors known to man. How do we do this? Because graphene is, a, is conductive, right? It's highly conductive along its plane. It's also single, uh, atomistically a single sheet, all right? We have a patent on combining that with hexagonal boron nitride, which is the cousin of uh, graphene, but it's a insulator. Also a single sheet of boron and nitride in a hexagonal pattern. Right? So if we combine the two and combine layer, alternating layers of hexagonal boron nitride and uh, graphene, we essentially have the highest density supercapacitor that's possible because the uh, capacitance of a capacitor is, dependent, is inversely proportional to distance, the spacing. And so now we're talking about atomistic spacing. Right? So we have a lot of uh, you know, future roadmap for these type of uh, applications. Uh, I'll just point out that uh, uh, we, we have, uh, our team is made composed of experts who have demonstrated the ability to, uh, you know, really change industry. So my father, for example, has gotten awards from the president, uh, you know, for uh, influencing uh, the Taiwanese semiconductor industry. Uh, just as another example, uh, in terms of diamond synthesis, uh, now 95% of the world's diamond supply is, uh, is being produced in China up from 0% about a decade ago. And that's mostly uh, a lot to do with the fact that my father did some tech transfer to them. So we have the ability to change industry. We have the ability to actually commercialize this technology. Uh, so this is our, our team here. Uh, we are uh, focusing, uh, so the technology side we've gotten taken care of uh, through my father uh, and his research lab in Taiwan. But uh, we have an all UST team here. Uh, here just to drive uh, the business development. I think this is where we really need to actually uh, make progress. We had this technology for a long time. We just haven't had the ability to actually find the resources to be able to scale it and prove the pilot production of this material. And I think this is the, the critical step that's necessary to really uh, make this into a commercialized setting. So we're hoping that through Google Software X and maybe even getting into Google X, uh, we will have the resources that we need to actually make this into a reality and truly drive the EV uh, revolution. So thank you very much.
And so for my challenge uh, to, to the audience here today is uh, I, we have this uh, amazing technology to create graphene, but it's not clear to us how to roll out that technology. Okay? There's many different options. Actually, for example, uh, make, going straight for the battery market uh, may not be the most advisable thing in the sense that uh, batteries uh, uh, take a long time to develop and the market isn't mature. So actually, if you look at uh, A123 systems in the States, for example, uh, as, a, as a case example, uh, they were betting on the EV market to, to, to turn and uh, eventually ran out of money. So we have the ability to go into things like supercomposites, into ITO glass, into a lot of different things. We have the ability to position ourselves uh, from the range of a uh, raw material supplier all the way through applications. And so within this space, uh, I would love to find out more uh, thoughts from uh, you guys in terms of what you think the proper strategy f uh, is in, in order to roll this out. Right, thank you. Fantastic. Now, Michael, do you remember about like a year ago, we had difficulty recruiting students because nobody understood what this project was? That's right. But actually, to be, to be honest, uh, this project has gone through a couple iterations of the matrix in terms of uh, teams getting on and off. Uh, but I, I believe that the team that we have now is, is, is quite capable and actually has background in both uh, logistics as well as uh, you know, working with uh, composite materials and things like that. So I, I have a high hope that we will be able to uh, go further this time. Thank you.